of everything. So let's see. So we, we were looking at SL2C, right? The the Lorenz group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll just start that again. Let's see. Uh, so Lorenz group. We want to preserve the line element. I saw a picture of Davy's stomach gosh. Oh, yeah. He knew it was that bad. Yeah, he really. <clears throat> they had to open up his head. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. From the back over here. I know. Yeah, it's just scary, isn't it? I know. Have they gotten the lab test back yet? No, they they haven't finished the analysis. Yeah, which is kind of scary also because like should I take that long to be able to detect anything? Mm, no, it, it could take a few days. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what they will do. They probably have a backlog, and mm -hmm. so it, it might not be immediate. Uh, point worrying until there's a point worrying. Oh gosh, where is everybody? <clears throat> Let's see. Who are you missing? Davis won't be here. Kevin has lab, right? I think so. So, Peter. Yeah. I haven't seen him today. Yeah. Who else? Anybody else?
Okay, so quick review of what we did last time, right? Um, we, we would like to describe the cover group of the Lorenz group. Uh, its essential property is to preserve vector length in space-time. So what we notice is that if we define a general Hermitian matrix uh, where we multiply t times the identity and uh, dot the three vector x into the Pauli matrices, we showed that every Hermitian matrix has to have that form for some four real numbers. So <coughs> we can always do this, and it takes this form. Then notice that the determinant of that is exactly the vector length uh, for the for the four vector t x y z. <coughs> um, so in order to describe four real numbers for a space time point, all we have to do is uh, write down any Hermitian matrix and uh, to transform that into any other. Hermitian matrix with the same determinant, we need to preserve the determinant. So <coughs> that means we can write our transformation as uh, an adjoint similarity transformation, where uh, A can be any 2 by 2 complex matrix at all, as long as we multiply by its adjoint. And in order to preserve the determinant, uh, x prime equal determinant x, we need the absolute square of the determinant of A to be 1. So the determinant has to be just a phase. But <coughs> since a phase commutes with this transformation, we get an e to the phi here, i phi here, e to the minus i phi there, it cancels out. So we <coughs> lose no effective transformations if we restrict it to determinant 1 uh, elements uh, otherwise, we're looking at uh, linear transformations in uh, two complex dimensions. So the group we're, we have is SL2C, S special meaning determinant 1. Otherwise, any linear transformation um, uh, in the group, which means it has to be invertible. So SL2C is a representation of the Lorentz group. So what we want to do next is to choose an infinitesimal basis. And uh, <coughs> uh, let's see. Um, so if one plus some epsilon <coughs> times the generator, uh, then we could, all right, let's, let's, let, let's let the generator be alpha, beta, mu, nu. <coughs> so um, where these are all small, uh, then we have one plus alpha, beta, mu, one plus nu as our infinitesimal transformation. And then the determinant of g equal 1 tells us that uh, 1 plus alpha plus nu plus alpha nu minus mu beta um, has to be 1. But we neglect quadratic terms. And uh, that's true if and only if nu is minus alpha. And so <coughs> m has to be traceless. Okay. So then stop, stop me if you have any questions. Boy. <coughs> These two classes in a row, my voice is going. <sighs> okay, so yeah, we... we we start with a Hermitian matrix that can, any Hermitian matrix at all can be written in this form. Right? Yes, for, for real numbers, dx, y, z. Okay, and then Hermitian means x dagger equals x. So for it to be special, determinant of x has to be 1. Uh, no, no, x, x is our representation of a 4 vector. So this is, this is a 1 to 1 onto mapping between 4 vectors 
dxyz. So real four vectors in space time and two by two complex matrices, Hermitian matrices. Hmm. The transformation is A. Hmm. That's, that's what has to have determinant one. So oh. see, we have to preserve the determinant of X. The determinant of X is our, our vector length. So, so in order for that to be preserved, the determinant of A times the determinant of A dagger has to be one, mm -hmm. which means it's a phase. And that phase doesn't do anything here. So we just set the determinant to one. Okay. So that, that makes a Lorentz transformation. Right. Mm. Right. Okay. So so now in order for an infinitesimal generator M, I can write uh, the infinitesimal transformation as one plus M, and ask the determinant of that to be one. That then I just take the determinant of this matrix toss out the higher order negligible terms, cancel the ones, and I see that nu has to be minus alpha, which just means that this m is traceless. So, um, is that writing over the top? Sorry? What is that writing over there when he says let a equal be what? Oh, here? The, 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 the square root of the determinant. Oh, okay. So, you know, that's, that's going to be some phase. The yeah, I phi over two, A naught. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and because you get the dagger here, that phase is going to just cancel out. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So now we want to write. Uh, are you you guys with me? Yes. Okay. So we want to write a basis for all traceless two by two matrices, and uh, we can do that in any number of ways. But uh, one, one set we can choose. I can choose Ki to be polymatrices and Ji to be I times the polymatrices. And <coughs> last time, ah, good. Oh, uh, this is a review so far. Let, I'll, just, I'll just quick run through. We want to preserve the vector length to have a Lorentz transformation, recognize that if we write a general Hermitian matrix, that gives a one-to-one -one map between real four-vector components and uh, Hermitian two-by-twos. Uh, we, we showed that that's the form of a general Hermitian matrix before. Um, so the only thing we have to specify to be able to specify four unique real numbers is to demand that X be Hermitian. Then it corresponds to a point in space-time. Now, we want to preserve the length of that vector. That turns out to be exactly the determinant of that matrix. So <clears throat> what we need for Lorentz transformations are any transformations that preserve hermeticity and determinants. All right, so if we, if we sandwich X with A and A dagger, that guarantees that X prime is Hermitian, as any time X is. And if we have the magnitude squared of the determinant of A equal to 1, then the determinant of X is preserved. So with those conditions, A is a Lorentz transformation. Since the overall determinant factor in A does not actually change X prime, uh, we have a whole equivalence class of transformations that give the same X prime, <coughs> we can just we can arbitrarily uh, specify the determinant of our transformation to be one, and then we have one unique transformation for each Lorentz transformation. And <clears throat> that means that SL2C is a representation of the Lorentz groups, S meaning special determinant one. Questions? Okay, <coughs> so now, yeah. 
What about the Poincaré group? Then you have to you have a translation on top of that, yeah. right? So what I would say for the Poincaré group is I would preserve the infinitesimal line element, right? That's invariant under translations, right? And now, um, this this wouldn't be a sufficient representation. I'd need to go to something else because I, uh, you know, I, I could have a, a translation here, and th there is a way to, to to build a translation into a a, a linear transformation. Um, yeah, I'm just doing a side here. Uh, suppose I I um, have my Lorentz transformation here. So I put A here, and I put 1 there, and uh, A, B here, and I let this act on, <coughs> oh, let's see. Now that, well, yeah, no, let's, Let's let's do this. Let's do this for the real transformation. So let's let's let this be a, a four by four Lorentz transformation, and go to five dimensions. So here we have uh, some four components of a constant vector. We put a one here. We put um, uh, we put x uh, alpha here, and this is our Lorentz transformation. X alpha beta. Uh, call that beta. Then if I multiply this out, what I'm going to get is lambda alpha beta x beta plus a mu here, and then I'll reproduce the one there. So that, that gives me a translation by bumping the dimension up one. It's still a group. It's still a group. It's, it's still a linear representation of a group. So <coughs> that's... One way to represent the Poincaré transformation, there are lots, I mean, there are infinitely many representations. Um, another one would be to, to let um, uh, your, your Lorentz transformation uh, be um, x mu d nu minus uh, x nu d nu, and your translation be just mu that acts on a function space but it's a linear representation and you can commute the, the compute the commutators of these it's, it's the Lorentz it's those are generators of the Lorentz, Lorentz group um, once you've got the Lie algebra you're in a position to um, reproduce all the elements of the group and uh, work with it gauging whatever <coughs> so we were finding the infinitesimal generators an infinitesimal transformation will take this form, 1 plus alpha, 1 plus nu, mu and beta. Uh, if I take the determinant of that and require it to be 1, then I cancel the quadratic terms and see that it has to be traceless. So what I want to do is write a basis for all complex traceless matrices. Since we know that the poly matrices are three independent matrices, and traceless. We can take those, and then we can take i times those. And that'll give us six independent uh, traceless two by two matrices. Good? You see? All right. So um, I think I give us an exercise exponentiating one of these, but uh, we've already exponentiated the j's, e to the um, I phi over two n dot sigma um, is is a rotation uh, by phi around n hat. Right, uh, that's that's SL. Uh, uh, sorry, that's SU two. So the anti-Hermitian generators will give uh, a rotation group. Right, and we've seen that quite generally that the the generator should be anti-Hermitian. <coughs> Let's look at uh, an exponential of uh, a linear combination of uh, just the poly matrices with no i here. You know, that's no longer going to be just a um, uh, a, a rotation. Let's see, so what is it going to be? Uh, let's write this, let's write W as 
some psi times a unit vector. <coughs> and so we want to exponentiate psi n dot sigma. And we've already shown what happens to powers of n dot sigma. Uh, this is going to be 1 over k factorial psi to the k n dot sigma to the k, where n dot sigma to, um, to an even power uh, let's see, what was it? We got we got that projection operator or something, right? We got, um, should we work it out again? Or, yeah, do you remember, do you have that down? I don't think I do. Um, let's see, we, we, worked, we worked through these powers. Yeah, that's, that's, squares, that's squares back to itself? That would uh, eventually, it comes back to itself. If we square it, I can write that as n i n j sigma i sigma j, and we know that the product of poly matrices is Kronecker i j times the identity plus i epsilon i j k sigma k, and so um, n i n j on the delta gives one, and here n i n j on uh, the epsilon just gives uh, zero. That's that's n cross n. So this does just square back to itself. So this series is going to alternate. Uh, we have n dot sigma uh, unit vector to any even power is going to be the identity n dot sigma uh, to the two k plus one is going to be n dot sigma. And this is this is for any k uh, greater than zero. This is for any k uh, greater than or equal to zero. Um, now zero, right? This is this works for k um, equal to zero too this time. So now, for the even terms, we're going to have one times the sum one over two m factorial psi to the 2m, um, and we pulled out the 1, um, there's no alternating sign. That's, that's the only real difference here. <coughs> then the odd terms give us n dot sigma, and what we're left with are the odd powers, 1 over 2m plus 1 factorial times uh, uh, m psi to the 2m plus 1. And those sums are no longer sines and cosines, they're cinch, cinch and cosh, cosh and cinch. So you get the identity times the hyperbolic cosine of psi plus n dot sigma times the hyperbolic sine of psi. Let's see, now to, to actually carry out a boost, what we need to do is, is multiply this. So we should get a boost. We, we know that sines and or cinch and cosh can give us a boost. You know, we, you know if you take uh, V over C to be tanch psi, this will put it into the usual form of Lorentz transformation. But to, to do a boost, we, we let X prime be um, this matrix, E to the psi n dot sigma uh, times x times E to the psi n dot sigma, where sigma is Hermitian, so we don't get a sign difference here. So that says, all right, x prime is some um, x alpha let me call it sigma alpha, where sigma alpha is just the identity matrix or the poly matrices. Um, that's, uh, let's, let's call this x tilde. So uh, that, that real linear combination has to be um, this one uh, 
uh, cosh psi plus n dot sigma cinch psi. I'm going to get double angle formulas, so I should have written psi over 2 here. <coughs> Times, um, right, here we have our original x alpha sigma alpha, um, which I can write as, uh, let's see, that's t times the identity plus x dot sigma. And then I have this factor again, 1 cosh psi plus n dot sigma cinch psi. So this should perform a boost in the n hat direction. Um, let's see. Well, I'm going to I'm going to get a double angle, but that that shouldn't matter. So <coughs> let's see. Let's just take a term at a time here. We're going to have cosh psi. Um, Right, that's the one times times the product of these. Let's go ahead and write out T cosh psi plus T n dot sigma cinch psi plus x dot sigma cosh psi plus x dot sigma n dot sigma cinch psi. Um, let's do this way. Then we have one cosh plus n dot sigma cinch. And then if we multiply all that out. Um, should I keep going? Should we move on to a different thing? <clears throat> Is this? Yeah, we can move on. Yeah. Yeah, you, you see where this goes. You use the product of poly matrices to resolve these. Just like we've got that general <clears throat> rotation formula. And I've already uh, assigned you doing this for SU2 to show that SU2 gives that same formula. So, uh, you know, I, um, unless you really want to see it again, let's. Uh, Let's let you work through that. But that will generate a boost, where x prime is a boosted form of x. So, uh, yeah. So the poly matrices already have boosts built into them. It's kind of relativistic qualities in those yeah. matrices themselves. Yeah. I always thought of the spin, but it's actually got. Lorentz invariance and in, in yeah, it, it's spin if you if you make it anti Hermitian, right? You know, there's always that I when you do SU two. So yeah, yeah, a poly a polymatrix actually generates a boost. Never knew that. I thought it was yeah, pure spin. Yeah. Okay. Here, let's. Um, uh, I guess, I guess we got the camera over here. Might as well work here. Let's find out the Lie algebra of these guys. Let's look at their commutators. That tells us a little bit um, that the J and the K here. So uh, if I take the commutator of two J's, that's the commutator of I sigma I with I sigma J. So we get minus the commutator of two poly matrices. And we know that that is 2i epsilon ij k sigma k. So we reproduce our rotational thing. Notice now we have an i here that combines with that sigma, so I write this as a real structure constant, 2 epsilon ij k with j sub k. I could rescale these to get rid of the minus 2 if you wanted. <coughs> but with real structure constants, these close. So the J's in themselves, the I sigmas, form a group. The commutators of those generators close. 
And so that forms a group. Well, we know that the exponentiation of uh, a linear combination of the J's is an element of SU2. Question? And that's rotations. That's rotations. But you know, this was all developed even before relativity, right? Like some yeah. of these group qualities or were Yeah. I mean if you knew no, if you knew right? all about groups, you know, hundred and fifty years ago. Did they even derive the boost equations without quite understanding what they were before Einstein? You think they may have Well, Lorentz developed the Lorentz transformation as a transformation of the Maxwell equations, which were probably first put in the present form by Boltzmann. Um, the, uh, uh, so the Lorentz transformation and, um, well, the, the constancy of the speed of light from the Michelson-Morley experiment pretty much underlies Einstein's development of special relativity, which was accepted immediately, uh, historically. I mean, people said, oh, yeah, this is, this is the answer. This is the way to think about these things. But did Lee already, because they, they've classified all the Lee groups. Yeah, right? let's see, it was probably part time classified, yeah. them, wasn't it? So, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, this was, this was known. People knew about unitary groups from a mathematical point of view. Uh, the application to physics and spinners was due to Dirac. I, I don't, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, Pauli. Pauli used the Pauli matrices, which are, do form a Clifford algebra and uh, do lead to the fundamental representation of SU2. He used those to incorporate spin into the Schrodinger equation. So the Clifford algebras were already there. Yeah. Right? That's from 1800. Yeah, Clif yeah, Clifford was late 1800s, I think. But they just didn't understand the full implications of this. Right? Well, they, you know, they knew. Like, they knew what those objects were in, in terms of group theory and transformations and so on, but uh, uh, for applications to physics, you know, that, that was uh, decades in the future. But it was there. It was there, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, knowing the group theory, you could have predicted spin. Nobody did. <laughs> right. Nobody did, <laughs> right, yeah. And, I mean, Dirac finally predicted spin from the Dirac equation and uh, you know, predicted spinners as physical representations for Fermi Dirac particles. Yeah, well, the Dirac matrices, right, and their commutation yeah. relations were actually known beforehand, right? They're older, I believe. Yeah, they must have been. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they, yeah, they arise from a Clifford algebra. Hmm. And all right, we're going to talk about those a lot. Now, we've just shown that SL2C is a representation of the Lorentz group. Mm -hmm. We're gonna write another one called spin one three. Right? We're gonna develop the Dirac equations as another way to represent uh, Lorentz transformations. So how can you, you said from the group you could generate spin, so. Yeah, if you, if you, if you have SU2, if you understand SU2, uh, that's uh, that's the way spinners transform, right? So yeah, the, your reasoning in 1900, if you knew a whole lot of group theory and enough physics, might have been something like, uh, okay, I know that um, SU2 uh, acting on um, rank two tensors uh, is um, it can do the same thing as a rotation by, you know, we, what we do, phi and n um, on a real three vector, right? So, so you, would know, you would know this about the group theory. You would say, well, this means that there are some two component objects that SU2 transformations act on uh, to give new two component objects. So uh, since I know that rotations are what leave uh, Newtonian physics invariant. I can I can do a, a an orthogonal transformation of f equals m a, right? And it still holds. The vectors just rotate. So that's an important invariance of the laws of classical mechanics. And so I can say, well, 
That means that instead of real three vectors, there, there must be some two-dimensional complex objects that uh, are um, representations of rotations as well. So in addition to working with real three vectors, uh, forces and momenta and so on, you know, I should work with complex two vectors as well and write some equations for how these things evolve. Only no physicist at the time would have known what those would be. So the techniques were there, but the application was yeah. still known. That's right. Yeah. It was, uh, I guess, the 30s before Dirac you know, came up with uh, 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 four component spinners. Pauli, Pauli wrote, well, the Pauli or the Schrodinger Pauli equation, um, where where you put a, a, a coupling, you put a sigma dot uh, magnetic field, or is it potential? Um, maybe it's potential. Uh, you know, acting on the wave function. You put something like this into the Schrodinger equation, and that can give evolution of the spin. Once, once they, uh, let's see, what, what, when they were looking at spectra. Um, from the predicted by the Schrodinger equation, hydrogen spectra. You see these splittings of lines. Um, yeah, what, what's the experiment? Um, yeah, I'm forgetting the. Um, yeah, there's there's, oh, there's an interesting bit of history. We, no, not not Rydberg. The, I mean, there were all those series, right? The Poshin series and the uh, you know all these different series of lines of hydrogen were known. But they were they were trying to to understand them, and uh, there's there's this experiment was it Zeeman uh, where you pass uh, the atoms through a magnetic field to separate oh. the lines, right? And you know it, it was fortuitous they had it wrong, right? They they thought it should split into you know some certain number of lines. Oh gosh, I forget the story now. I think it's in my quantum notes, though, uh, where uh, the uh, I think they were only seeing odd numbers of of spectral lines or something, and it took them about three years to sort that out. Probably in the middle twenties, uh, they were trying to verify the Schrodinger equation without its spin effects. They didn't know spin was there. <coughs> But in order to account for those spectra, they, they had to have that extra degree of freedom. But what's crazy is, here's this group structure. Yeah. From the simple group, you get this incredible yeah. landscape. Right. Yeah. And nature uses it. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, these two vector things, they're real. I mean, they Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, who, yeah. who, we who see would these. imagine, right? And, yeah. It's like nature just fills up everything it can. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a good rule of thumb. I mean, that's, that's a, something that's been said about the, the path integral. You know, if it can happen, it will. Right? You know, just if it's possible. Uh, you know, if this motion is possible, if it, it can, you know, pair produce, you know, then some percentage of the time it's going to look like it pair produced. Uh, on you go. Um, it's a mistake to neglect the possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow the math. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got to know which math to follow. You've got to you've got to have some mapping between the math and you know the physical measurable things. If I could just sure. a little digression. Sure. You know, I read that Clifford uh -huh. tried to describe gravity using curved three space. And it didn't work. The problem right. was he yeah. did not use space time. That's right. That's right. So yeah, I didn't. I didn't know Clifford had done that. Yeah. I know Gauss yeah. tried to measure tried. whether whether we lived in a curved three space. Right. 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 That's a well-known experiment but, that was yeah, way he too tried to sensitive. Grab it. He had the right idea. It seems that the big, you know, well, we I, I can show you incorporate exactly. time. I can show you exactly how it works, Stephen. Let me, let me draw you some pictures here. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, you know, the, the problem is you would like for a particle to follow a geodesic, right? So, uh, you know, independently of 
the initial conditions, you know, if, if something goes from here to there, you know, any two things should follow the same path, you know, the equivalence principle, right? So, you know, suppose, suppose we mark out X and Z here, and uh, we're going to shoot something from here to here. So we shoot a bullet from here to here, and there it goes. But now, if we want to shoot an arrow from here to there, it, it's going to go like that. Well, those aren't the same geodesic. No way. But, put in time. Put time going backwards here. And now, okay, uh, let's draw this, and poof, there's your bullet. Happened fast. Okay, there's your arrow. Takes a longer time, goes higher. If you compute the first order, the radius of those two curves, they're the same. Try it. You know, it's, I mean, it's a little geometry, and you can do that, right? It's time, right? It's, yeah. So you have to include the time, or you never get those things following uh, essentially the same curvature path. And then that x right there, x dot sigma alpha. Yeah, that's yeah. four dimensions, right? Or is uh, that three? Well, a t, t and x, right? Yeah, this, this x is, uh, yeah, if we take sigma alpha to be one in the poly matrices, it's four. That's a basis for Hermitian matrices. Right, but it's and, four. Right? Yeah, and that's four. So take a four vector on that. Yeah, this x alpha right here. So that's where time comes in, the yeah. fourth component. Yeah, that's right. And it's so hard to think of time equivalent to distance. I think that was the great handicap, mental handicap. Uh -huh. like time is yeah. the, the yeah. same footing as distance. Right? And you have a lot of uh, great thinkers to thank for sorting that all out. I mean, Minkowski was the one who said, hey, this is a four-dimensional space. He, you know, to believe it, he had to make time imaginary so it was Euclidean because, you know, a, 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 yeah. a, pseudo, a pseudo metric wasn't the popular okay. idea then, but yeah. but we got there eventually. Okay, and what I want to show you, uh, returning to the, the no no these are interesting questions. You bored? No, no? no. Okay, good. We're fine. Uh, let's let's look at J with K. So notice the J's close into the J's and they form a subgroup of the Lorentz group. The rotations form a subgroup of the Lorentz group. Great. Okay, J with K is I sigma with a sigma. And so that's I, and the commutator of two poly matrices gives two I epsilon IJK sigma K. So we get a minus two epsilon IJK, a real structure constant, with just a sigma, that's a K. So a J with a K is a J. A rotation of a boost gives another boost. Now let's look at K with K. This gets interesting because now we have sigma I with sigma J, which we know is 2I epsilon IJK sigma K, and here's an I sigma K that's a rotation. 2 epsilon ijk jk. So the commutator of two boosts is a rotation. This is the origin of the Thomas precession. Yes, the John. commutator of a rotation in a boost gives you another boost. Right. And the commutator of two boosts gives you a rotation. That's right. Wow. But the rotation is close. They form a subgroup. But, yeah. but boosts don't form a subgroup. If you, if you do a boost and another boost, which is what happens in an atom, right? The Thomas precession, you, you know, if, if you're following like, the electron uh, around, around the nucleus, um, you know, it's, it's accelerating. And to, to do it, you, you, you boost to the rest frame of the nucleus, then you boost to the frame of the, the moved electron. And you end up commuting two boosts, basically, which gives this anomalous precession of, of the electron spin, well, the Thomas it's also precession. also a factor of two, right? There's, that's, it's that two uh, I, I, comes the, No, the, fact, the factor of two is just the normalization of the generators, right? 
uh, Lie algebra relations are nonlinear, right? So if I multiply j by a factor, k by a factor, k by a factor, I've got a free factor. So I can I can get rid of that too. That's that's just a that's just how I've chosen the basis for my Lie algebra. Wasn't the, pre the Thomas precession twice what the classically was expected? There was some. Oh yeah, I, you do you do get a factor of two out of it, but right. you need to work through it. Uh, I think Jackson does it. Um, yeah. I know I've written it up somewhere in notes. So that two is not that that two is not the two. Okay. Yeah. Just you know, multiply this by a half, and this by a half, and this by a half, and you get rid of the two. I always thought Pauli matrices were simple and boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's trivial matrices, right? It's yeah. just simple one matrices. Is yeah. how yeah. yeah, they're they're brilliant. <laughs> They're unitary. They're Hermitian. They generate boosts. They do generate rotations. Anything you want them to do, they can do it. They're magical. Let's look at two new generators. Uh, J plus K and um, a half. Which way do I want to do this? A J minus K. Right. If I look at Lm with Ln, that's, I'm going to get a quarter Jm plus Km with Jn plus Kn. Alright, so that's a quarter. All right, Jm with Jn is minus 2mn, oh, sorry, 2 epsilon m and k j k then j with k is all right that's this one we're going to get minus 2 epsilon m and k k sub k and then k with j that's minus j with k uh, and J with K is going to be, now that's J N with K M, so I'm going to get um, plus 2 epsilon N M K, K sub K. And then uh, K M with K N is going to be 2 epsilon M M K and uh, J sub K. So let's see, uh, somewhere here we can pull out a half for sure. <clears throat> and then, let's see, we have two, two J's here. Let's see, well, we can pull out an epsilon MNK. And then what are we left with? Here's a minus JK. Here's a minus KK. Here's a now, here, I flip these and I get a minus sign, so here's another minus k sub k. And m and k, I have uh, plus, whoops, is that right? k with k. Um, something's wrong here. Uh, m and k, so it's like jk. Why is, why is this not right? There's a minus sign up in the first, yeah, the minus first sign. line. The one-fourth, there's a minus between Jm and Km. One line up. Here. There's a minus there. Isn't it? There? Yeah. Um, I'm doing L with L. So, oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, let's see. L with L. M and All right, I've got a minus here. K with K. Huh. All right. It loops, right? It's, it's those damn <laughs> minus signs oh, yeah. get you every time. Okay, let me double check I. All right. 
No, I need I need to check these signs. Something's not working. Um, yeah, the the one could any be the order that you're using on the epsilon that you have to take into account? Yeah, I, I wanted to get an L back here, and that doesn't seem to be right. M and K. Yeah, but let me let me try an L with an M and see if that one works. Okay. Maybe, maybe I just have the wrong things here. An L with an M. Okay, so um, I'm going to have a quarter, then J M plus K M, and then J M minus K N. Let's see if that if that were right. Um, I'd be doing the same thing except that, let's see, these guys, let's see, K, 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 gives you a J, K, sigma I, what is epsilon N, F, this 2i, epsilon yeah, I, J, K, K is to three three plus dollars. 2. So, yeah, so this sign's right here. But you have to flip that over there on the last turn. Yeah, Absolutely. so that that would change, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is MN. This one, this one flips. Yeah, yeah. Oops. But I didn't have to change any order for anything else. Um, but let's see. So I've got this one here. Then this one. So that one would flip, and the last one would flip. Mm -hmm. So this would be plus, and that would be minus, and then. Uh, what am I getting? Then the K's are canceling. This, yeah, this this isn't this isn't coming out right. Something's yeah. Maybe I need an I someplace or something. But let me let me look at this and it, I'll put it in the notes and talk about it next time. Um, the the point here is that there's some linear combination you can take of J and K uh, where these the two different ones commute with one another and. The LMs satisfy the SU2 Lie algebra, and the Ms satisfy the SU2 Lie algebra. So <coughs> SL2C actually breaks into two uh, independent copies of SU2. The Lie algebra does. The group, the group doesn't factor that way, but the, the Lie algebra breaks into two copies of SU2. So uh, what you can do is uh, break your spinners into similar parts. You know that you can have a whole space of spinners that are acted on uh, by SU two by this SU two, a whole independent set of spinners that are ignored by this but acted on by the M's. And that's a very useful notation. You'll find it described in in Wald or Penrose and Rindler. It's a very useful technique to. Right, general relativity in terms of those. So, so, what would the answer be for the L's? I mean, if you so, so here, we, and what we should be getting is <coughs> um, uh, I epsilon L. Okay. And here we should be getting zero, zero. and okay. M with M should be I epsilon M. Absolutely. Um, so, that's, so uh, I'm probably missing an I something. So, there are set spaces. Yeah. Two of them are. Yeah. So, so, the two commute. So some, something's wrong here. Okay. Now, let's uh, well, let's go to the board and look at Iraq. <laughs> so the the basic history is. It was encountered by Schrodinger in writing the Schrodinger equation. People in the 20s recognized that you wanted a wave equation where the wave was described by uh, momentum and energy particle properties. And the Schrodinger equation gives that. Uh, the Klein Gordon equation gives that quite nicely, but the Klein Gordon equation has. Uh, uh, second time derivatives. Therefore, requires two initial conditions, phi and phi dot, basically position and momentum, which quantum mechanically you can't have, you can't know both of those, so you could never set initial conditions on your equation. 
So what people wanted was an equation first order in time derivatives. And Dirac recognized that in order to do that, you, um, it would also have to be uh, first order in spatial derivatives. So you need some linear combination of all four spatial derivatives in order to have a relativistic first order wave equation. Uh, then this object, uh, acting on some state, ought to give something like the mass up to, you know, well, what, m's, mc over h bar. <coughs> now, so Dirac wrote this down and said, okay, you know, we want this, we want this to hold, uh, and uh, what he did is require that it imply the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, let's see, minus m squared, sign like this. So, and let, let me get my signs here. Yeah, that's right. So, huh. need to revisit that. Uh, so, how do you, how do you get from this the Dirac equation to the Klein-Gordon equation? Well, acting twice should do it. So, if I act with uh, gamma beta d alpha d beta on gamma alpha d alpha um, acting on psi. Uh, that's the same as gamma beta partial beta acting on m psi. M is just a constant. These gamma matrices are just some constants. These gamma, these gamma objects at this point, we don't start out knowing they have to be matrices. But then this is just going to give uh, another m and a psi back. So, so this operation, um, what is it, gamma beta, all right, the, the derivative goes on past here, so gamma beta and gamma alpha d beta d alpha uh, needs to turn into the d'Alembertian, or minus the d'Alembertian. And <clears throat> the question is, how can that possibly be? Uh, if, if these are numbers, it can't be, right? It, you know, if, if gamma was just some, some vector, v beta, v alpha, d beta, d alpha, then I could perform a boost so that v was just some, say, time component. And then this matrix, v beta, v alpha, would just be ones and zeros everywhere else, and um, contracting that with a pair of partials is just going to give d squared uh, time. This, it can't give the d'Alembertian. Uh, single vector doesn't have enough degrees of freedom, given the Lorentz invariance, to, to actually give you uh, what, what you need is to build eta here. You know, this, this, or this object, here we go. Uh, in order to give the d'Alembertian, that's minus eta alpha beta d alpha d beta. So this gamma alpha gamma beta has to somehow produce uh, a non-degenerate matrix. You can't do that with a single vector. So the next, uh, the next more complicated object you could have here is for these to be matrices. And the thing that makes this work is that the product of two partial derivatives is symmetric. This is the same as d alpha d beta, um, which means that I can, I can shuffle indices here and write this as the symmetric part, gamma alpha, gamma beta, plus gamma beta, gamma alpha, partial alpha, partial beta. Uh, that's, that's the same thing because of the symmetry imposed by the partials. Everybody sees that? You good? So, so I can equally well, because this is symmetric, I can equally well write it this way. Um, now, if I demand that that be minus eta, I can do it. I, I need objects. Let's define the 
anti-commutator of two matrices to be gamma alpha gamma beta plus gamma beta gamma alpha. So anti-commutator, commutator would just have a minus sign. Now we have a plus sign. Then what we can say if we multiply by the two is that gamma alpha gamma beta is minus two times eta alpha beta. That will, that will reproduce the Klein-Gordon equation from the Dirac equation. Now, let's see. Uh, let's tune this up a bit. Um, I can get rid of that minus sign if I, if I put an i here. So if I were to put an i here, then that would put a minus here. And uh, I'd still have an i there, but that would work. Then here, I'm going to have a minus, a minus, and so I can get rid of that minus sign if I require I gamma alpha d alpha um, minus m psi equals zero. <coughs> so, our next while is going to be spent in looking at properties of things that satisfy uh, this bracket relationship. Objects that satisfy this are called the Clifford algebra. And this equation is the Dirac equation. And what we will find is that from, these are called either gamma matrices or Dirac matrices, we'll find that these uh, have to be of a certain size depending on the dimension. In four dimensions, they have to be four by four. Uh, they need to be matrices. And uh, from them, uh, from their commutator, in fact, we can build generators of the Lorentz group. So this will give us another way to represent the Lorentz group. We'll find that it is a two to one cover of SO31, or uh, SO13, I guess we're working with. So, um, like, uh, like SL2C, uh, these objects that the Dirac equation acts on must be spinners. Now, since these turn out to be four by four matrices, these spinners have four components. And then, after writing this, Dirac was faced with the task of uh, identifying the meaning of those four components when everybody knew that spin up and spin down were two component spinners. Led into the prediction of the positron. So, mm -hmm. now that deserves a Nobel Prize. Yeah, that one does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Yeah, I, there, there was there was input other than Dirac's and identifying that as the positron, but but uh, you know, it's right there. I think originally they thought it might be the electron and the proton. Yeah, yeah. Until, uh, uh, but then when, when you do the gauge theory, what you uh, find is that the, um, you know, you, um, the, the, trans, the, the, the charge, you get a conserved charge, the way it couples to electromagnetism. And uh, the, the charge of the four components are, you know, this has a minus charge, this has a plus charge, but the same magnitude. So you don't, uh, it doesn't bear out as the proton. Um, the masses are yeah, the mass. Yeah, the masses are the same. Okay, so let's explore properties of these guys. And um, I think that I think let's, let's stick mostly to four dimensions. I, I work out uh, almost everything we say here is going to work in arbitrary dimensions. But uh, we just let the indices run further and there will be uh, completely analogous things we can say. But let's, let me stick to four dimensions. For me. Yeah, so quick question. There's, there's no relationship between that and the Poisson bracket, or is there? Uh, no. That's a, it's a different bracket. Yeah, this is symmetric. Poisson is anti-symmetric. 
Right? This is just what I defined it to be here. Um, now, commutators and Poisson brackets, that's canonical quantization. Right? Taking, taking the Poisson bracket over to IH bar times a commutator uh, is, is, the, is canonical quantization. And we'll be using that. Okay, so now, uh, all right, one thing we could do is just to find some matrices that do this. In fact, what happens is that the, uh, you know, let's see, that's not the direction I went here. I might flip this around a bit. Yeah, let's, let's just explore these. So, uh, the, a symmetric product of two gamma matrices can always be written as uh, an anti-commutator, half of an anti-commutator, and the, the anti-symmetric part. Where that's the commutator just as a minus sign here. Now, this part just becomes uh, twice eta, the half cancels, so we get it eta alpha beta. And in fact, since these are matrices, there's there's a an identity matrix there. Uh, here, there's an identity matrix. Okay, eta alpha beta is just coefficients. It tells you, you know, you get plus or minus one or zero depending on the values of alpha and beta. Essentially, we have a bunch of matrices that square to one, but <clears throat> anti-commute with one another. <coughs> uh, so this means that the only new thing we get when we take products of uh, gamma matrices, the only new matrices we can generate are anti-symmetric parts. If I take a product of three, gamma mu, all right, I'm going to get eta alpha beta and a gamma mu, um, and some permutation of those, you know, there will be an eta alpha mu, gamma beta, um, eta uh, beta mu, gamma alpha. So symmetric pieces here are all going to give something like this, uh, and all I'm going to be left with is a totally anti-symmetric product, which we denote by a square bracket on the indices. Uh, <clears throat> round back brackets for symmetrization, square brackets for anti-symmetrization, and it includes, if we've got three indices, it includes a 1 over 3 factorial. So it's taking the anti-symmetric part of that product. So the, the new things that we can produce Uh, right, we have the identity matrix, we have our original gamma matrices. Then we can take the commutator of a pair of gamma matrices. We can take the anti-symmetric triple product. And how far can we go, folks? <laughs> yeah? I will go as far as four terms and more than that. After that, it's zero. Right. Because all right, the indices run 0, 1, 2, 3, anti-symmetrizing, they all have to be different. So once you've got 4, you can't go any further. So there are a limited number of distinct matrices that we can produce by taking products of these original 4. <coughs> um, we might as well count them since we're here. Here's 1, here's 4. Um, okay, uh, this is 4 times 3 over 2 is 6. Uh, here we have uh, four again. Uh, let's see, how would you do that? Uh, four times three times two over one times two. Wait a minute, what is it? Uh, one times two times three. Let's see, three. Yeah, three, two, one. Okay, there's four. And then here, there's only one of those. Why do you have six again? On. Say, when the commutator has six. Oh. 
right? An anti-symmetric right, Four and three. thing Four has and six three. components. Yeah. So we could have as many as uh, 10, 15, 16. Uh, there could be as many as 16 different matrices we could build from this. In fact, they are. These are all different. And uh, to prove it, let me first let me first develop a little bit of um, a little bit of sim uh, a little bit simpler notation. What I want to do is define one more matrix, gamma five, to be some multiple of epsilon mu nu alpha beta, gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma alpha, gamma beta. And uh, let's see, this, um, well, let's see, this has two properties, but I, uh, we really, to get those properties, I think we might need some properties of the other ones. <coughs> Um, <coughs> which I don't know if I've written down here, but the uh, our original gamma matrices, uh, <coughs> we we can ask whether we have Hermitian or anti-Hermitian uh, representations of these, and uh, if we take um, yeah, uh, just as an example, notice that the commutator of two, the anti-commutator of two poly matrices, uh, the symmetric part, remember the product is Kronecker times the identity uh, plus the epsilon. Well, if we're taking the symmetric product, we're just going to get twice that Kronecker times the identity. So the, the um, poly matrices form a Clifford algebra, one more property of poly matrices. Uh, in fact, this is why we get spin from them. Here, the we um, notice that the poly matrices are Hermitian and give positive numbers here. If if we looked at the anti-Hermitian form of these guys, we would get a minus sign over here. And so here, when we're trying to get a, an indefinite signature, we want minus for the spatial ones and plus for the time. Uh, we might guess correctly that the we can take the uh, the time one to be Hermitian and the spatial ones to be anti-Hermitian. So I'm going to claim that there exist gamma zero Hermitian and gamma i uh, dagger anti-Hermitian. And we'll come up with a representation that does that eventually. Or, yeah, let's see. Now let's let's go ahead and work with the representation. Um, suppose suppose we take gamma i to be sigma i sigma i zero zero. So think of it as four two by two pieces here. We'll write these as four by fours. Then gamma i squared is going to be uh, sigma i squared is the identity, and then we get sigma i squared down here, we get the identity. But we need for these to be minus, because the metric is minus. So we're going to put i's here. And now we get minus 1, and that's what we want. We want minus the identity there. So, um, if I look at gamma i uh, anti-commutator with gamma j, that's going to be um, i sigma i, i sigma i, with i sigma j, i sigma j, plus interchange i and j. So that's going to give us minus sigma i sigma j here, and 0 and 0 and minus sigma i sigma j there, uh, plus the same thing with i goes to j, so sigma j sigma i minus sigma j sigma i. And now, uh, 
we have an overall minus. And then this is just the anti-commutator of the poly matrices, which I've written over there. So I'm going to get Kronecker IJ times 2 here, Kronecker IJ times 2 there, which is just minus 2 delta IJ times um, the identity matrix. And that's minus 2, that's plus 2 times our Minkowski, eta IJ, the spatial parts of our Minkowski. So uh, these are three of the matrices we need to satisfy this Clifford algebra. Okay. Question? Why do you have a 2 on the Kronecker? A 2? Because uh, I'm adding these two. Oh. I'm, I'm explicitly, it's, oh, a, I, it's, I, the, it's the anti commutator. I yeah. see the minus sign, I see the minus sign. Yeah, so they, they come together. So I pulled out all four minus signs here. Okay. Okay, so uh, now we just need one more. Um, let's try something like gamma zero is. Uh, Let's, now, what's going to work here? Right, gamma zero needs to, to be zero with these three spatial ones. And uh, let's see, we should be able to make it Hermitian. Uh, let, me think, let me think what's going to work here. If I had minus that, plus that. Yeah, I think, I think we can get away with something like one and minus one here. The thing two by twos because if I take gamma zero that squares to one uh, so um, gamma zero squared plus gamma zero squared is going to be two times one times the plus one for a to zero zero uh, if I look at the anti commutator of gamma zero and gamma i that's going to be all right we have one minus one times I sigma I, I sigma I, let's see, we've got too many things going on here at once, plus the other order, I sigma I, I sigma I, with one minus one. So this product gives uh, minus I sigma I down in this corner, then here we get I sigma I up there, then this product the one's going to hit the one down here, so I get plus i sigma i here, zeros here, and this one becomes minus i sigma i, and those total up to zero. So these four matrices, these guys and that one, uh, actually satisfy this relationship. So that's that's a proof that there exists some four by four matrices that satisfy this property. Uh, I should let me let me write them somewhere. So let's. Uh, oh no, well, we've got them up here. Let's just put them all up here. So gamma zero is one minus one. Okay, you erase. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll wait a minute. Uh, questions. Today is just not my good day. I've been teaching since 9, I'm so tired. I finished teaching at exactly 3.30, I just grabbed myself. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> You're out. It's, it's 4.50 already, I didn't realize it was so late. I know. Um, like this. Yeah, I don't know, anyone here cows? <laughs> uh, let's see. Let, let, me, let me just briefly point the way we're going. Okay, uh, this gamma 5, we're going to show that it's... We're going to choose lambda so it's Hermitian, and it squares to 1. And I, I claim we can make those choices uh, without much trouble. Um, just multiplying these out, but actually, quite generally, uh, you can show that you can build this object. Uh, let's see. Let me say it another way. Um, this, this Clifford algebra relationship is invariant under uh, general linear transformations. If I, say, if I do a similarity transformation of each of these, uh, the, the interior thing goes away, I just 
end up with a similarity transformation of the identity, which gives the identity again. So once I have any set of gamma matrices that works, basically any similarity transformation by a general linear transformation will give me another one. So there are infinitely many of these now. We've found one. We know that uh, this is invariant under transformation, and so we can find as many as we like. Now, uh, if we show that gamma 5 has these properties, we can do a similarity transformation, transform all of these, and show that uh, the gamma 5 still has these properties under similarity transformation. So it's sufficient to show that for our particular choice of gamma matrices, gamma 5 has these properties. And you might try that for Monday when you're more awake. <clears throat> what about those 16? I mean, we've. Okay. What, yeah. are, what are the others? So, well, uh, we're going to prove that these are all independent. All right. This, this one we can replace by gamma 5. Um, you know, there's only one of these, and it's just, uh, gamma 5 is just as good as that. Then this one, having. <clears throat> um, you can show that you can write something proportional to this by taking gamma 5 times uh, a gamma mu. So we're going to work with those two instead of these two. They're a little easier to work with. We'll give this one a name sigma. And we will prove that they're all independent. So they form a basis for 4 by 4 matrices. We can take arbitrary complex combinations of these and form any any. Um, any spin spinner operator we like, right? If, if we want to write a general interaction of spinners, right, we can build it out of gamma matrices. And that's proved very useful. So what, um, uh, we'll go through a proof that these are independent. Uh, it will involve uh, computing traces of products of gamma matrices, which is something that you need to learn in order to do quantum field theory. Uh, QED, you're always taking traces of gamma matrices. So the basis has 16 elements? Uh, there, are, there are four of these. Right? But then from, from products of those, we can build, uh, you know, a, we give these a, a general name, you know, gamma something, you know, can be this whole set. And uh, you know these these describe any four by four matrix. We so want. it's sixteen because there's sixteen components. Yeah, four by four. Yeah, that's right. So any complex linear combination of these sixteen matrices, uh, you know, is some four by four space. It's the four yeah. by four. It's yeah. a four dimensional. Yeah. Well, it's sixteen, 16 dimensional. Space. You know, thirty two real dimensional space. Um, Let's see, uh, these have some neat properties. Uh, these, these sigmas, will turn out to be generators of the Lorentz group. We, we will find the commutators of these satisfy the Lie algebra of rotations of SO31. <laughs> and so these and uh, the exponentials of these will be Lorentz transformations. And we'll find a way to represent a real four vector as a rank two tensor uh, built from these objects and spinners. And uh, then eventually we'll look at interactions. Like the weak interaction actually is a, an equal combination of the gamma alpha and the gamma five gamma alpha. That's the parity violation because gamma five has a levy cheek the tensor in it, which behaves oppositely under parity than uh, the. Normal. So all the properties of particles and the, and the standard model come from these? Yeah, we're going to see these a lot. Yeah, so it's worth the time we're going to spend now to understand how to work with these. And all that comes from that Clifford algebra equation. Yep. That's all it is. That's right. Yeah. But Clifford couldn't have, why Clifford didn't use the signature so minus one and then no no I, I mean he he probably used the positive just definite plus, metric plus here. Ones. yeah yeah so he didn't quite do that but no no he didn't write this um, I think what he was doing is classifying Lie groups yeah 
you know, and this turned out to be a useful structure for doing it. But then, of course, you can have all kinds of signatures on that too. Yeah. If you want um, to. Okay. Take this to be a PQ metric. Then this will generate the spin group associated with SOPQ, and it's called spin PQ. And is that any meaningful thing in physics? Oh yeah. All right. String theory lives in ten dimensions. Right. In 10 dimensions, these matrices have to be 32 by 32. Right. We still need them. We still have the Dirac equation for all those spinners in 10 dimensions. Right. A 32 by a 32 component complex vector breaks into eight spinners, eight four-dimensional spinners. Right. So you get a whole spectrum of particles out of one string spinner. Right. Yeah. Work in other dimensions, and these. These Clifford algebras are still there. What if you have more than four? If you have eight components, like P, you know, S yeah. well, six two. Okay. You know. What what we're going to show? Since these are all independent, right? That that means that, um, all right, we we have to be able to form. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, let's see. Sixteen independent. Uh, matrices, but in, in n dimensions, you know, you you can do more of these. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, you'll you'll find that there are two to the n in n dimensions. So four dimensions, we get sixteen. There, yeah. you, there'll be two to the n of these, which means <coughs> that these generating matrices have to be at least two to the n over two by two to the n over two, or you don't have enough degrees of freedom to do it. Correct. Right. So a spinner in n dimensions has two to the n over two components. Is it a good idea to write a mountain bike downstairs? So spinners, I mean, you can have spinners in n dimensions. Yeah. And string theory is just one. That's one example selection. where we need that. Then you can get E28 or something. There's this other special group. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's a group, not a space. But, okay. Well, it's a space. But, yeah. Let's not do E8 today. Oh. <laughs> okay, we have cows. I hear cows. Oh. All right. More next time. No, no, no more.